Ray Carruth is a handsome and wealthy NFL star who loves to surround himself with the company of women. When beautiful and ambitious Sharika Adams catches his eye, the pair begin a casual physical relationship. However, what starts off as a laid-back liaison brutally ends on a dark, lonely road in a hail of gunfire. Hello and welcome to The Dark Side of Love. I'm your host, Bianca Sloan, author of suspense novels about the dark side of love. And this week I'm putting a spotlight on the case I'm calling Penalty for Murder. Ray Lamar Theotis Wiggins was born in Sacramento, California to Theodry and Charles Wiggins. Charles quickly abandoned the family and his son, who would become known as Ray. The Audrey would later marry a man by the name of Samuel Carruth, and Ray would adopt his stepfather's surname for himself. Ray grew up in the Oak Park section of Sacramento, known for nightly shootings, a river of drugs, and an abundance of gangs. A neighborhood where bars on the windows and cars being set on fire were a way of life. Despite the crime, despair, and poverty surrounding him, Ray managed to keep his nose clean, avoiding the pitfalls of gangs and violence that sent many of his friends and family to jail. His mother and stepfather divorced when Ray was 14, and as a result, his home life became tumultuous as he ping-ponged between the homes of different relatives with very little stability. While Ray avoided the temptations of the streets, he wasn't throwing his energy into academics, likely because of the chaos of his home life. He wasn't a great student at all, but he did have athletic talent, With his 5'11", 195-pound frame, he gained a reputation as an outstanding sprinter who had an aptitude for football. As the New York Times reported, Dave Haskins, who was the football coach at Valley High, where Ray attended school, encouraged Ray to retake some of his classes so he could jack up his GPA in order to qualify for a spot on the football team. Ray did as he was told and made the team as a wide receiver. The hard work and determination would pay off again when Ray scored a football scholarship to the University of Colorado, where not only does he do well on the field, catching 53 passes for 1,008 yards and nine touchdowns during his senior year, he maintains a B average while majoring in education and English. His teammate Matt Russell told the New York Times, quote, he didn't go to bars, he didn't go to parties, he kept his nose pretty clean. He was probably one of the more well-behaved guys in my class. Now, while Ray could preach all day about the importance of staying off drugs and alcohol, studying and working hard, one thing Ray could not do was keep it in his pants. By so, so, so many accounts, Ray likes to surround himself with girls. Lots and lots and lots of girls. And it seems girls like to surround him As GQ first reported in 2001, it wasn't hard to see why girls flocked to Ray due to, quote, this baby face, the contours all smooth and rounded, the outward down slant of his eyebrows giving him this puppy dog swatted with a newspaper look. Girls loved to take care of Ray. And Ray really, really enjoyed these women taking care of him, with GQ noting, quote, he thrived on them and fed on them and drew sustenance from them. Except GQ also observed that Ray, quote, really didn't like women at all, going on to say that, quote, he liked to F them, he liked their attention, and he liked the idea of them, but he didn't like them. So although Ray is playing most everything by the book and flourishing at the University of Colorado, a trip home to Sacramento in 1994 and his penchant for women will trigger an unfathomable chain reaction that will change his life forever. So while he's home for this visit in 1994, he has a brief fling with an old high school friend, 18-year-old Michelle Wright, who she was like a sophomore when he was a senior in high school, and she gets pregnant. GQ reports that throughout the pregnancy, Ray, quote, waffled over whether to keep the baby. According to GQ, Ray's indecision was not a surprise to Michelle, as she, quote, knew him as a man of many moods. He could be a real joker, or he could be a cipher, or he could even be, in the dark moments, the devil himself. 
Michelle gives birth to a son who she names after his father. Except Ray isn't much, no, let me correct that. He isn't any kind of father to his son, Zip, Zilch. He pretends like the kid doesn't even exist. No child support, no birthday presents, no cards, no phone calls, persona non grata. Ray is much more concerned with his football career and his looming entry into the NFL. He joins the exclusive club of lauded first-round picks when he enters the NFL draft in 1997, going to the Carolina Panthers as their first choice and 27th pick overall. He signs a four-year contract worth $3.7 million, with a $1.3 million signing bonus as the cherry on top. And the money kept coming. For example, just a few days after signing his contract, a trading card company dropped a $15,000 check in the mail to Ray just because. I would like to get a $15,000 check for just being Bianca, and if someone can tell me how to do that, just give me a jingle. Call me. Now, instead of sending some of that money to Michelle for the care and feeding of their son, Ray, instead, in his infinite wisdom, endorses the check over to his 17-year-old girlfriend, Amber Turner, who lives in Boulder, and gives her instructions to get them set up in Charlotte with a place to live, the whole thing. Now, did you notice that I said Amber, the girlfriend, is 17? Ray is not 17. As GQ astutely noted, quote, even as a fifth-year college senior, Ray's taste still tended toward post-adolescence. Once Ray signs that big fat NFL contract, Michelle says enough is enough and sues Ray for child support. Ray fights the suit and at one point a judge temporarily orders him to pay Michelle $5,550 a month. Michelle reaches out to Ray and says, listen, I'm willing to take half of that amount if you'll just be a better father to your son. Call him more often, make arrangements to spend more time with him, do better, be better. Ray said, okay, you got it. I will do better, be better. Well, no, no. Ray, predictably, completely reneged on the promise. Instead, he suggested that Michelle bring his son to Charlotte to visit. According to GQ, she agreed, saying that she would rent a car and keep herself occupied while Ray spent some long overdue time with his son. Michelle said that Ray's response was, quote, don't be surprised if you get in a fatal car accident. Ray claimed he was joking, but what's funny about that? I don't know. Nothing. Um, according to the girlfriend Amber, he said to her one time, quote, Would it be messed up if I had somebody, you know, kill Michelle and my son, or just my son so that I wouldn't have to pay her any money? Or if she got in, like, a car accident or something happened to her, I could have my son and I wouldn't have to pay her money. I'm guessing he probably told Amber he was joking like he did with Michelle, but still, who says that? Even though Amber stuck around through Ray's first season with the Panthers, she did eventually run home to Colorado. Except, as is usually the case with these kinds of situations, Amber made a quick visit to Charlotte and, surprise, she got pregnant. As GQ notes, quote, as Ray's responsibilities and missteps threatened to collide, as his little kid appetites met his stunted ability to cope with adversity, he began to consider a solution both novel and bizarre on the surface, but certainly logical in the context of a man who regards his women as disposable and dispensable. Anytime he'd get a woman pregnant, he'd threaten her with death. Ray demanded that Amber get an abortion because he did not intend to have any more kids with a woman that he did not plan to settle down with. And to make sure that Amber knew he was serious? As Amber herself said, Ray told her, quote, Don't make me send someone out there to kill you. You know I would. Amber didn't need to be told twice. She got the abortion. Sharika Adams named in part for Cher, yes, the Cher that you're thinking of, was born in 1975 to 17-year-old Sandra Adams in rural North Carolina. According to Sports Illustrated, while Sandra's parents were disappointed that their daughter was a teenage mother, they supported her, and when Sandra graduated from high school, they insisted she go to college while they raised the baby for her. 
Her parents' generosity and assistance enabled Sandra to graduate with a psychology degree from UNC Charlotte and eventually land a good-paying job at IBM. Once Sandra was stable and secure, she brought Sharika to Charlotte to raise her. Described by Sports Illustrated as having, quote, deep brown eyes and a willowy frame, while her friend Valerie Brooks told the Charlotte Observer she could have rivaled Halle Berry or Beyonce, Sharika's looks led her to a successful modeling career for local print advertisements while she was still in high school, the money enabling her to buy a BMW and a Mitsubishi Coupe. Despite attending college at Winston-Salem State University, Sharika eventually decided that school was not for her and dropped out after a couple of years. She had big dreams and big plans for herself and was in a hurry to get there. So, she got into real estate. As a former classmate of Sharika's told the New York Times, Sharika was, quote, a classy person, real nice, a smart girl, very ambitious. Sharika is so ambitious, so eager to make money and secure a comfortable life for herself that she adds another job to her resume, becoming a stripper at the Diamond Club, which is a topless bar in Charlotte known to be popular with the city's pro athletes. Sandra, Sharika's mom, told the Charlotte Observer podcast, Carruth, that initially she was not at all happy with her daughters going to work at a strip club, for one, because they came from a Christian family. However, she said she began to change her mind when she saw how much money Sharika was pulling in and when Sharika explained to her that she was dancing as a means to an end, that it would help her get a condo, fatten up her bank account, that this was not going to be forever. This was not going to be a career for her. Uh, Sandra even said that she used to joke with Sharika that, hey, do the dancers need a mom? Can a mom get paid for taking care of the dancers? Uh, So she came around eventually to uh, Sharika's choice. As Sports Illustrated reported, part of the life that Sharika was yearning for, like most girls, was the fairy tale. The big wedding, the husband, and a lot of kids, or more precisely, quote, a whole football team. So a cute, young, and ambitious girl who, as the New York Times noted, was used to being around professional athletes, having dated them since high school, having babysat for Hornets players, and even working as an intern for the Panthers, This is the type of girl that would seem on the surface like a great match for someone like Ray Carruth. Except we know that Ray Carruth, he's not a good guy. He does not like women and that the last thing any girl should be doing is getting mixed up with him. Sharika, of course, doesn't know any of this when she meets Ray in the summer of 1998. Now, there is some dispute about exactly how they met. Um, There were some reports that they met at the Diamond Club, where Sharika was working and Ray was hanging out. Uh, Though Sandra disputes this, having told the Associated Press that Ray and Sharika met at a party hosted by another Panthers player, like a barbecue or a pool party, something like that. Um, But what isn't in dispute is that there is a physical attraction between them and that they consummated that attraction. Uh, The seriousness of the relationship between Ray and Sharika, well, I guess it depends on who you ask, because it seems like it was mostly just them hooking up. Um, Though, as Sandra told the podcast, Carruth, she, when she, Sandra, when she met him, she was super impressed with him um, and that he had bought a cell phone for Sharika, that he called her on it all the time, always wanted her to be available, always wanted to know where she was. Uh, Sharika's friends told the New York Times that when Sharika met Ray, she was infatuated with him, but she didn't have any illusions about him. So it's, I don't know, there's a lot that I think you can pull from both sides of this. Um, But at any rate, Sharika, frankly, she was right not to have any illusions about Ray because, of course, he has a robust roster stuffed with multiple women. Uh, But in May of 1999, it was Sharika who announced that she was pregnant with Ray's baby. In Ray's mind, the baby news is just one more thing. He's, he's not having a great uh, string of luck at this point in his life. He had broken his foot and, as a result, missed most of the 1998 uh, season with the Panthers. He came back in 1999 but saw his playing time reduced after a series of errors on the field. Then in October of that year, he sprained his ankle, which put him on the bench for another month. 
adding to his woes were mounting financial problems. He only had a year left on that fat NFL contract, and as GQ noted, Ray was on his way to becoming that, quote, singularly sorry football phenomenon, a first-round draft pick gone bust. He'd invested in a car loan scheme of some sort, kind of some kind of pyramid scheme that collapsed and put a dent in his bank account. Uh, when he couldn't get financing on a house he was trying to buy, he had to back out of the contract, so the owners sued him. And then the guy that he'd hired to manage his money, his former wide receiver and sports agent Tank Black, had gone to jail on fraud charges. And remember, he's paying Michelle back in California over $5,000 a month in child support for their son. So it's against this backdrop that uh, Ray tells Sharika that he wants her to get an abortion, which she refused to do. So at first, Ray puts on a good show about being there for Sharika and for the baby. GQ reported that he had kept a new set of baby furniture on standby at a storage facility that he was renting. And Sharika's friends told the New York Times that Ray still took Sharika out on a regular basis and would tell her all the time that he wanted her to have his baby. Lending credence to what Sharika's friends are saying, Ray even took her to some Lamaze classes that reportedly it was at one of these classes that he even learned uh, for the first time what her last name even was. So, uh, you know, kind of what I was saying earlier about it being maybe a casual relationship, that's maybe a little less than casual. Um, at any rate, according to the New York Times, Ray's financial situation factored heavily into his interactions with Sharika, with her complaining to friends that the two of them argued about money a lot. Specifically, him giving her a hard time whenever she asked him for money. Ray is also not happy about the teasing that he's getting from friends and teammates about the situation. According to GQ, Ray's circle is incredulous that he allowed a stripper, of all people, to lock him down. That Sharika was supposedly running all over town bragging about having trapped Ray and was on her way to Easy Street. As GQ observed, Ray was, quote, tired of being victimized, tired of having these women sucking out his sperm, tired of being rewarded for all his kindness by predators and gold diggers, tired of taking the ragging, panicked at the money situation. And it's at this point in the game that Ray's wheels start turning. Ray didn't have especially close ties with his Carolina Panthers teammates. Several outlets reported that a lot of Ray's time was spent holed up at home by himself, playing PlayStation all day. However, while he wasn't close with his teammates, he had started to make friends with a whole new crew of guys. Guys who were real. Guys from the streets. And who were these new pals? One was a crack dealer by the name of Michael Kennedy, also known as Little Man. Another guy named... Van Brett Watkins, a.k.a. New York, whose claim to fame was stabbing his brother, setting another guy on fire, and holding a meat cleaver to his wife's face. Rounding out the circle was Michael's friend, 19-year-old Stanley Abraham, who, like Ray, had no criminal record. The New York Times reported that Ray had hired Van Brett Watkins to detail his Mercedes-Benz, and that he's the one who introduced him to Michael, or Little Man. So, Ray's got a problem, and he knows that these are not good dudes, and he says, hey, wait a minute, these bad dudes can solve my problem, and then I'll be golden. Again, the logic. Since Sharika had rejected his first idea, which was to get an abortion, Ray's second stroke of genius was that he would take Sharika to a Lamaze class, and that Van Brett Watkins should meet them there, and beat her up, you know, like punch her in the stomach, that kind of thing, thus causing her to lose the baby. Van Brett Watkins took three grand from Ray to carry out this plan, but he never showed up. After that didn't work, Van Brett Watkins agreed to go to Sharika's par apartment, like a home invasion kind of thing, and beat her up there, except he didn't do that either. Uh, then he was going to ambush her behind a restaurant. And every single time, Van Brett Watkins kept taking Ray's money and not beating up Sharika. I mean, wow. Um, at this point, 
Ray apparently has had enough of the stalling. Because the more time that passes, the chance of causing a miscarriage is slip sliding away and he's getting desperate. So he says, you know what? I'm done with this. And instead, he hatches a plan to murder Sharika and their unborn baby. November 15th, 1999. Sharika is seven months pregnant, about 28, 29 weeks along. She's at home when Ray calls her. He wants to take her to the movies. She agrees and drives to his house. According to Sports Illustrated, when she got there, Sharika called her mother because she was feeling a little uneasy. There was a lot of weird stuff happening that night. Some strange dudes coming in and out, something about a bootleg television, I don't know. Um, Sandra says to her daughter, then you know what? Don't go. Cancel. Go home. Sandra overheard Sharika tell Ray she was leaving and also heard Ray convince Sharika to stick to the plan and go to the movies. Sharika relented and got into Ray's white Ford expedition and they headed out to a late show of The Bone Collector starring Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. After the movie, they would head back to Ray's house and Sharika would spend the night. Sports Illustrated reported that Sharika's roommate got a phone call from Sharika around midnight. Change of plans. Instead of spending the night at Ray's, which is what she was originally going to do, she's heading home and Ray would be coming with her. She asked the roommate to straighten up her messy bedroom for her. Ray and Sharika had gone back to his house to pick up her car. He led the way in his Ford Expedition back to her apartment, which was about 10 miles from his house. Following behind Sharika's black BMW was a rented gold Nissan Maxima. Van Brett Watkins, Michael Kennedy, and Stanley Abraham are inside. The three cars are traveling on Ray Road, a winding four-lane street separated by a tree-lined median, the lanes narrowing the closer you get to Calvary Church. It's secluded, dark, quiet, practically deserted. It's now 12.30 a.m. Ray slams on his brakes. Sharika does the same. The gold Maxima zooms around and comes to a stop on Sharika's left, the driver's side. She's trapped. Van Brett Watkins gets out of the car and fires five shots from his 38 caliber special revolver into the BMW. Ray, still in his car, speeds off, calling another girlfriend as he heads to a friend's house to spend the rest of the night playing video games. Michael Kennedy turns the car around in the opposite direction. Sports Illustrated reported that he says he can see the BMW's brake lights flashing red in his rearview mirror, letting him know they had failed at their mission. At 12.31, a call comes into the Mecklenburg County 911 Dispatch Center. It's Sharika calling from that same cell phone that Ray had given her. She told the dispatcher, I've been shot. For 12 agonizing minutes, as she gasps for air, as she moans, as she honks her horn, hoping to get someone's, anyone's attention so she can be saved, Sharika is able to describe her car, her exact location, and even provide a description of Ray's car, his license plate number, and crucially, what Ray did, namely stopping his car, which allowed another car to pull up beside her and shoot her before he drove away. Sharika was eventually transported to Carolina's medical center. Four of the five bullets had invaded Sharika's body. Three of them didn't do much damage, but the fourth one had ripped through her like a missile, tearing holes in her intestines, shredding her organs, severing veins and arteries, and passing through her stomach. She is losing blood as fast as the doctors can give it to her, six liters in all. Miraculously, this diabolical bullet misses the baby, a little boy. It would be about 70 minutes from the time Sharika was shot to the time doctors performed an emergency C-section. And while the little boy quite literally dodges a bullet, his life was in jeopardy all the same. 
He was suffocating on his mother's blood, and he'd been deprived of oxygen during those 70 minutes, which resulted in the loss of brain cells. Instead of a healthy pink, he was a bone-chilling blue. By now, Sandra has made her way to the hospital, and as Sports Illustrated reported, she asked Sharika what she wanted the baby's last name to be, Adams or Carruth. Sharika was clear, Adams. She did not want her baby to have Ray's last name. Unbelievably, in the midst of all of this, Sharika was able to motion to a nurse for a notepad where she wrote down what had happened making it crystal clear that Ray was responsible for all of it, writing, quote, he was driving in front of me. He stopped in the road. He blocked the front. Shortly afterward, Sharika fell into a coma. Sports Illustrated reported that when Ray came to the hospital, he, of course, had yet another girlfriend with him. I mean, where does he find these women? It's crazy. Uh, who, as in, uh, Sandra told Investigation Discovery's Deadly Sins, this girl is rubbing his neck, she's massaging his shoulder because he's just so stressed out about the situation. Oh, poor, poor, pitiful Ray. We're all crying for Ray. According to Sandra, no surprise there, uh, Ray never once asked her about Sharika and, as stated in Deadly Sins, apparently said to the girlfriend, uh, the girl that was with him, quote, I hope she dies, meaning Sharika. And because Ray's self-absorption knows no bottom. According to the New York Times, the day after the shooting, Ray was at a girlfriend's apartment. I'm assuming it's the same one who was at the hospital with him, but who knows. Um, But according to her, he was on the phone with his stepfather in California. Again, this is the morning after the shooting. And after he hung up, he said, quote, or she said rather, quote, he broke down into tears. I don't believe what's happened to me. So, again, everything is all about Ray. Ray, 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 Ray. He was, however, incredibly inquisitive about the baby, asking all kinds of questions about him. You know, who knows what was going on in his mind um, at that time. But he was very curious about his son. Uh, The baby, who was named Chancellor Lee Adams, had Sharika's eyes, but everything else about him was all Ray. No mistaking who this baby belonged to. Police immediately launch an investigation, and there's a lot to unearth. Sharika's written statement about Ray's actions the night of the shooting point investigators squarely in his direction. They impounded his car, scoured his phone records, and conducted extensive interviews. Coupled with Sharika's statements, it's a foregone conclusion. He's, he's getting arrested. Nine days after the shooting, Thanksgiving Day to be exact, police head to Ray's house. When he opens the door, he's naked, as one is. Um, And there's, of course, a girl in the bedroom, no idea who. Um, Anyway, they arrest him. And after posting $3 million bail, Ray agrees to turn himself in if Sharika or Chancellor die. Police also arrest his accomplices and charge them with conspiracy to commit murder. Chancellor miraculously did survive. Um, Now, because of the lack of oxygen and his traumatic premature birth, he has cerebral palsy and permanent brain damage. Unfortunately, Sharika never comes out of her coma, and on December 14, 1999, one month after she is brutally gunned down, she dies. Sharika Adams was 24 years old. Ray is now facing first-degree murder charges, which means he is supposed to surrender himself to Charlotte police. And because Ray is so great at keeping his promises, he bolts, jumps bail, skips town. And he does this by convincing another girl, uh, her name is Wendy Cole, to drive him to California. He folds himself to the trunk of her Toyota with almost $4,000 in cash, clothes, some candy bars, some bottles of water, and a cell phone. And off they go. Ray calls his mom, Theodre, from the road to let her know where he is. Not long after that, authorities get a tip on Ray's whereabouts and race to the $36 a night motel in West Tennessee to find him. Turns out his mom is the one who told the bail bondsman where to find her son. 
uh, fearful, she said, of a trigger-happy cop trying to play the hero when capturing Ray. As GQ reported, FBI agents opened the trunk of Wendy Cole's car to find Ray with his eyes closed, not moving a muscle. Eventually, he opened his eyes and climbed out, hands in the air. Those water bottles had been turned into urinals as they were filled with his urine. Following his arrest, the Panthers cut Ray loose and the NFL suspends him indefinitely. Jury selection for Ray's trial began on October 23, 2000, with opening statements in the trial commencing on November 20th. Prosecutors got everyone's attention right from the start by playing that excruciating 911 tape of Sharika pleading for help and naming Ray as the responsible party. Ray's trial electrified Charlotte. It was described as their version of OJ's trial, and it became a media circus unlike anything the city had ever seen. Ray, who did not testify, pleaded not guilty, and his defense was that Van Brett Watkins and Michael Kennedy wanted him to finance a drug deal, but he refused, or he said he was going to do it, and then he backed out. Um, but he says because he refused to do this, Van Brett Watkins and Michael Kennedy wanted to take him out. And they just happened to find Sharika out on that dark, deserted road and demanded that she tell him where Ray was. And that after she wouldn't, she flipped off Van Brett Watkins in the process, and this just enraged him to the point that he shot at her five times. It's ridiculous, and nobody buys it. The jury finds Ray guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, of using an instrument to destroy an unborn child, and of shooting into an occupied vehicle. However, jurors find him not guilty of first-degree murder, which means he avoids the death penalty. When he was found guilty, Ray showed zero emotion, which seems totally in keeping with his personality. Van Brett Watkins received a sentence of 40 to 50 years for Sharika's murder. Michael Kennedy, who was driving the car that night, got 10 years and was released in 2011, while Stanley Abraham, who was in the car, served 90 days, three months, plus five years probation after pleading guilty to two lesser accessory charges. Ray was sentenced to almost 19 years in prison. Sandra, Sharika's mother and Chancellor's grandmother, fought for and won custody of her grandson, raising him from the minute he came home from the hospital. In 2018, Ray wrote a so-called apology letter to Sandra for what had happened to Sharika, sending it to a local TV station in Charlotte because he said that um, Sandra wouldn't respond to any of his other letters or communication and that this is the only way to get her attention, he says. It's an incredibly disturbing letter where, on the one hand, like I said, he's apologizing for what happened to Sharika and praising Sandra for raising his son, but also accusing her of lying about him to the media uh, over the years. The grievance tour continues when he rambles on about how he and Sharika never had a relationship. They were both sleeping around with multiple partners and on and on and on. It's... <sighs> He also asserts that he would like to have a relationship with Chancellor and that he wants to be considered for custody. Hmm. Hmm. Um, as I said, it is an incredibly disturbing letter. And, you know, Ray is going to Ray. That's, that's, that's really all I can say about that. Ray later backtracked, writing a letter to Scott Fowler of the Charlotte Observer saying, quote, For all involved or invested in this ordeal, please calm down. I will no longer be pursuing a relationship with Chancellor and Mrs. Adams. I promise to leave them be, which I now see is in everyone's best interest. Ray was released from prison on October 22, 2018, and moved to Pennsylvania to live with a friend. He indicated in an interview with Scott Fowler of the Charlotte Observer that he wasn't sure if he would stay in Pennsylvania, floating the possibility of moving to a foreign country at some point in the future. Chancellor graduated from high school in 2021, having made tremendous strides in a life that began so brutally. Where doctors were once unsure if he'd ever walk or talk, according to Westward, Chancellor is, quote, able to communicate, move with the aid of a walker, and even ride horses. He appears to be happy and loved.
Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Dark Side of Love. I'm your host, Bianca Sloan, and show your love for The Dark Side of Love by visiting thedarksideoflove.com for show notes and transcripts. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to be notified about new episodes and other information. You can also find a link to my Patreon page where you can access bonus material and other fun stuff. Learn more about my suspense novels about the dark side of love by visiting biancasloan.com. Thanks for hanging out with me and join me next time for another tale of love gone wrong. I'll see you on the dark side. <laughs>